Hi guys, um, my name is Sanjay Gupta. I am a consultant cardiologist um, uh, in York. And um, one of my friends, Jilly, asked me to do a video on microvascular angina. Now microvascular angina is, um, uh, is, a, is a condition that a lot of people are told they may have, and it's quite poorly understood. And, it and because there's no really good explanation that's given, often patients tend to feel very um, scared about what it could mean for them. Uh, they're, they're left quite troubled and they felt like there are not many treatment options. So I wanted to go through microvascular angina with you uh, just to uh, try and explain what it is. Um, the first thing to do is to try and explain to you what angina is, okay? Uh, the heart, this is the heart here, okay? The heart is a muscle. This is the muscle. You can see the muscle is nice and red because it uh, is getting blood. It needs blood, okay? It's a blood-rich area. It needs a lot of blood. When the muscle works harder, it needs more blood, all right? So, for example, when the heart is working harder, i.e. during exercise or um, when you're out in the cold weather, um, then your heart is going to need more blood to pump around. If the heart is working harder uh, to pump blood around, and therefore it's going to need more blood to supply this muscle. The blood is supplied by these... This is, um, here we go. The blood is supplied by these blood vessels here, all right? The, the red blood vessels, all right? Now you can see the red blood vessels sort of branch out and then they branch into smaller branches and eventually they sort of peter out. That's only, in reality, they don't peter out. They just become much smaller. They, they become much smaller blood vessels and they're called capillaries. And uh, you can see this area is red. And the reason it's red is because there are all these tiny, tiny blood vessels which are carrying this blood and actually supplying the tissue, all right? So whilst you can draw a certain number of blood vessels, you can't draw them all because they're so small. But ultimately, those small blood vessels are equally important because they're actually playing a vital part in getting this blood to the individual um, muscle cells. So <clears throat> if the heart muscle doesn't get as much blood as it needs for what it is doing, then the muscle will scream out and say, we need more blood. And that scream is manifest as a discomfort. And I say discomfort rather than pain because that's what a lot of people complain of. So when people exert themselves, if they're not able to get enough blood to the muscle, then the muscle will start aching and the patient will start complaining of a discomfort over the chest. And often it's described as a heaviness, a tightness, uh, a gripping discomfort that can radiate. It can radiate to the back, it can radiate to the arms, it can radiate to the shoulders, it can radiate to the neck or the jaw. Uh, but it usually tends to be brought on on physical exertion and gets better with rest. All right. So when someone like this comes to us as cardiologists and says, look, these are the symptoms, we automatically worry that there may be a narrowing in these blood vessels and therefore a significant part of the heart muscle may not be getting the blood it needs. Now, obviously, from the history, you cannot work out how tight that narrowing is. Is it a 70% narrowing? Is it a 99% narrowing? You need to do another test to work out how tight that narrowing is. Because if it were a 99% narrowing, and that was just waiting to close off and become a 100% blockage, then all that area that is being supplied by this blood vessel will become devoid of oxygen and die. And that's called a heart attack. And if the heart attack is big enough, then that can cause a person to die. And therefore, we do a test called an angiogram, which is where we pass a tube uh, through the wrist or through the groin, we pass it all the way up into the aorta, and we actually pass the wire through the aorta into these blood vessels here, okay, and inject some dye. And when we inject dye, we can delineate the blood vessels, and that will tell us whether there is a substantial narrowing. And the majority of times, we do find a narrowing. But interestingly, about 15 to 20% of the angiograms we do in people who are complaining of chest discomfort on exertion, which gets better with rest, we are amazed to find that there are no narrowings, okay? 
And therefore, although this is good news for the patient, because remember, if the narrowing is in a big vessel, that's more dangerous because there's a large part of the heart muscle that is being supplied. You know, if you have a narrowing here, well, if that blocks off, this blood vessel isn't going to get any blood. This blood vessel isn't going to get blood. So all of this area is going to be devoid of oxygen. That's a big heart attack. So you are reassured that there are no major narrowings when you have a normal coronary angiogram. Uh, but you are still left in a dilemma as to why the patient is getting their symptoms. Okay. Now, sometimes people assume, and it's important to assume, that it's important to stress the word assume because there's no way of absolutely being confident uh, that this is the case, but people assume that there may be a problem with the smaller blood vessels. And of course, on the angiogram, you can only see the big vessels. You can't see the tiny, tiny blood vessels simply because the resolution on an X-ray is not good enough. And so people say, well, clearly they're getting symptoms which are brought on by physical exertion and getting better with rest. The big vessels look okay. So maybe there's a problem with the small blood vessels. And that is the microvasculature, i.e. the small blood vessels are called the microvasculature. And those people are then told, oh, you may have microvascular angina. Okay. Um, <clears throat> now, for the patient, um, you know, that, that's, it's reassuring that you don't have any big vessels, but any big blood vessels, but they're then left with this label of microvascular angina. And uh, because there's no satisfactory explanation, it causes a great deal of anxiety and concern. So let me talk you through a few things, okay? The first thing to say is when you have this condition, there are more than one reason why you could still be getting discomfort in the chest. I know that people call it microvascular angina, but there are other causes as well. There were some studies that were done where they looked at what happened to these patients after they had their normal coronary angiogram. And interestingly, in 30% of patients, the symptoms vanished after the angiogram. So the patient ha was having chest discomfort on physical exertion, which would get better with the rest. To all intents and purposes, it sounded like angina. They had their angiogram. No one does any treatment. They just tell them, look, your heart arteries are normal, and the symptoms go away. So in those people, we have to assume that their symptoms were being caused by stress and anxiety. So in 30% of those people who have normal heart arteries with symptoms of angina, uh, it can be stress. And, and the way you know it's stress is because after the angiogram, after a few weeks, they come back and they say, oh, actually, it's all gone. I feel fine. Okay. So stress can certainly do this. Um, the second thing to say is that there is another, um, it could be something not related to the heart at all. And the obvious thing is the stomach, okay? The esophagus sits right there. We know that if you have reflux disease, the reflux disease gets worse on exercise. Uh, and if you get a chance, you should check out Simon Smale's um, video on our More Than Just Medicine channel on YouTube. Uh, but reflux gets worse on exercise. And therefore, if you're getting more reflux, you can get more discomfort on exercise. The problem is, very few people um, who have this kind of scenario are then referred to a gastroenterologist. And ideally, what you want is, if you have this scenario, you want to be referred to a gastroenterologist so that they can reliably rule out reflux disease. Otherwise, you're left under the impression that you may have this thing called microvascular angina, whereas actually it could just be reflux and good treatment of reflux will sort your problem out. Okay, um, uh, there was a study called the Pitfall Study that was um, published, I think, in 2008. And uh, what they found was they took about 28 patients who had normal heart arteries who had come in with symptoms of angina, who were thought to have microvascular angina. They did an endoscopy, they did a um, stomach test, and 27 out of 28 of them had stomach issues. And actually, when they were given uh, double strength proton pump inhibitors for an eight week period, the majority of them felt significantly better. So it's just worth bearing that in mind as well. You know, don't just take that diagnosis of microvascular angina because really there is no absolute 
confident way by which anyone can say this is definitely microvascular angina. We are assuming it's microvascular angina, but as I say, it could simply be stress and it could simply be something to do with the stomach. So always worth getting checked out by a gastroenterologist, all right? And then you have the conditions of the heart. So um, another thing it could be is maybe uh, you can sometimes get something called coronary artery spasm, all right? So the blood vessel itself is not diseased, but can go into spasm intermittently. And when it goes into spasm for that period of time, the heart muscle isn't getting the blood and therefore the, uh, you get discomfort. The difference between spasm and microvascular angina is that spasm can occur at any time. Okay, it doesn't have to occur on physical exertion only. Whereas with microvascular angina, it generally tends to occur more on exertion. So that's, again, another thing worth bearing in mind. Um, now, what if it is microvascular angina? Why does it happen? Some people link it to uh, an estrogen, a lack of estrogen, and it tends to occur more in women who've crossed the menopause because their um, estrogen levels are lower. Uh, what works for it? So, okay, let's assume you have microvascular angina. Is it dangerous? It's not dangerous, okay? It does not shorten your lifespan. The reason it doesn't shorten your lifespan, uh, and that is why perhaps doctors don't give it as much attention because they think it's benign, it doesn't shorten your lifespan, is because if you did have narrowings of the very small blood vessels, the myocardium or the heart muscle at risk because of the small blood vessels is very, very tiny, okay? Pain is pain. A small area of the heart muscle can ache as much as a bigger area of the heart muscle. So even if you have small areas of the heart muscle which are not getting blood, they will still cause discomfort. But that doesn't mean that if those areas are um, completely devoid of blood and they die, that will not have a big impact on the overall function of the heart and it will not cause um, any danger to your life. It is still very inconvenient because, you know, you're still getting the discomfort on physical exertion. Uh, and it's not nice to have the discomfort on physical exertion, even though you may feel comfortable that this is not something which is dangerous. What works for microvascular angina? Well, the first thing to say is I think it's important to take that fear out of your head that you're dealing with something dangerous. If you don't have that fear, you will feel better. All right. So getting being educated about this, having trust in your doctor, and believing what he tells you is, is a really good step forward, getting the fear out. The second thing to understand is that it is always good uh, to avoid smoking. It is always good to do exercise because exercise improves the efficiency of the heart. It will help in regenerating more blood vessels. Uh, it's anti-inflammatory. Having a good diet um, and reducing your weight is always a good thing if you're carrying extra weight and having good quality of sleep and keeping your stress levels low. Those are sort of basic lifestyle tips which help this condition and probably help it more than anything else, all right? Um, then for a lot of people, if it is microvascular angina, the nitrolingual spray can help. They, often they get given a GTN spray and the GTN spray helps. It's also worth bearing in mind that the GTN spray can also help people who have gastric issues. And so just because the GTN spray seems to be working doesn't absolutely, again, categorically tell you that this is microvascular angina. Um, <clears throat> number three, if the GTN spray doesn't help, then you can go on something called um, uh, oral nitrates, which are like the GTN spray, but in tablet form, and they act over a longer period of time. So instead of using the spray, you can take the tablet once a day or twice a day and that will help improve the symptoms and you can still use the spray on top should you need it um, then there are things like beta blockers there are calcium antagonists which act by opening up the blood vessels in terms of uh, uh, natural things keeping your magnesium intake high is really good because magnesium is a natural vasodilator and will help there are some newer agents now in the market. One of them is called Ronolazine, which works very well. Uh, there's another one called Ivabradin, uh, which works by slowing the heart down. And if the heart is slowing down, then it doesn't need as much blood, so you shouldn't get as much um, uh, discomfort on ex exercise. Uh, and that helps. 
Another thing to say is that some people do something called, um, you can do this thing called um, coronary sinus stenting. So basically what they, what they can do is they can actually, some people, and this is a very specialist thing, uh, you can actually, um, you see the arteries over here, what, what happens is the arteries are supplying blood, the blood goes into the small vessels, and from the small vessels it gets collected and goes up into the veins. Now if you uh, ligate or tighten up the vein or create a narrowing in the vein, then that means more blood remains in the arteries, in, in, in that area. And that's another thing they do, but that's a very specialist thing. Um, finally, it's always good to see if you can go and see a specialist in microvascular angina. There are really good centers all over the world. In the UK, St. George's Hospital have some world experts in the subject of microvascular angina. But overall, it is not a dangerous condition. Okay? There may well be other explanations, and it may not even be this thing called microvascular angina. And being educated with it, about it and having a good lifestyle and not being scared of it is a really, really important thing, all right? And just remember that point about making sure you go and see a gastroenterologist because there could be a simple, easy explanation. It could be reflux. Remember, reflux is so common these days. Um, uh, and it's largely due to all the food and all the kind of bad food that we eat, caffeine, etc. cetera. Um, so I hope uh, this was helpful. Jilly, this is for you. Um, and um, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to drop me a line. My website is yourcardiology.co.uk. Um, my Facebook page is on here, yourcardiology at gmail.com. And this is me. Uh, and I'm really, really uh, grateful for all the lovely feedback I get. And um, I'll keep trying to do more. If you want me to do any particular videos, drop me a line. If you find these useful, please consider sharing them. Uh, it's one of the few pleasures I have when I get back is just to see, oh, so many people have seen my video and it makes me feel great. Uh, so uh, so that, 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 that's a really good feeling. And also, if you drop me comments, you know, I love receiving comments. I love receiving feedback. Um, so I hope this was helpful uh, and I wish you all the best. Bye.